This presentation is going to be on the Bill of Rights and how these different rights were added to the U.S. Constitution. So our goal for this lesson is to summarize and apply the rights listed in the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Our vocabulary is the Bill of Rights, civil, criminal, double jeopardy, due process, quartering, jury, non-enumerated, amendment, and constitution. The essential question for this lesson is what rights are you guaranteed in the United States and how have they been challenged over time? So just a little background on the Bill of Rights. You should have had this in your reading, but I also want to just reiterate this. Um, so as a refresher, Americans declared their independence from Great Britain in 1776. In 1787, they created the Constitution. Remember that prior to that, they had the Articles of Confederation and they didn't really work, okay? The Constitution was a compromise between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And part of the way that they got that ratified was by including these Bill of Rights. So the Constitution told how the new government would work. So as a reminder, the difference between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution is that the Declaration of Independence, it was just declaring the United States its own country, whereas the Constitution is actually the supreme law of the land. It is the document that makes up our government. So when they ratified the constitution some people the anti-federalists mostly were not afraid were, were not happy with how the constitution didn't say enough about the rights of the people so in 1791 they added the bill of rights and the bill of rights are the first 10 amendments to the constitution and they are individual rights that the government cannot take away we're going to see later on as we go throughout the semester how the Bill of Rights has been challenged, especially by modern technology. The First Amendment, and probably the most um, influential one or the most well-remembered, is really important because it protects five things. So there are five protections in the First Amendment. The first one is your freedom of religion or worship. Um, also, you have the freedom of speech. And so there's different types of speech, there's symbolic speech, there's um, pure speech. This is your ability to dress a certain way. Uh, we'll talk more about what speech is and how speech is limited in the United States. We have the freedom of press, which is like newspapers and uh, media outlets. We have the freedom of assembly or the freedom to gather together peaceably. So you, how you can remember what assembly is, it's like when you go to a school assembly to, I don't know, celebrate Wish Week or a senior exit assembly or something like that. That is literally means a gathering of people. You also have the freedom to petition the government. So if you're unhappy with the government, you have the freedom to petition it for redress or to change something in the government. That's all protected in the First Amendment. The Second Amendment, which is also a really hot topic in the United States, is the right to keep and bear arms or guns. Um, some of you did this for your first assignment uh, that we did on something worth fighting for. It's a very uh, controversial topic, but has a lot of um, foundation in the American government that was created. The Third Amendment is the amendment that limits the quartering of soldiers. So the word quartering is actually an old word that we rarely use today. It means to house and feed. Um, so basically what this amendment was doing was trying to protect the people from having to house and feed soldiers in times of peace and in times of war. And so why they included this was during um, the time prior to the American Revolution, British soldiers would just go up to their houses and say, hey, you have to you have to let me in. You have to let me stay at your house. And they couldn't say no. The British government required them to allow soldiers to stay in their home, to eat their food. Um, and so as a protection to this, uh, to prevent this from happening, the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists compromised to include the Third Amendment. 
The other amendment, which is extremely important, is the Fourth Amendment. Um, and the Fourth Amendment protects your rights from unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, so really what this is about, this is your right to privacy. This is your right to have privacy from the government, from police officers. Um, and really, when we're going to talk more about how this works later on when we get to our civil liberties unit. But um, really, really important, right? And something that is brought up a lot now, especially when we look at what happened with the case of uh, Breonna Taylor and things like that. So we will come back to that. We'll circle back to that and look at that debate, um, especially surrounding that case later on. Uh, the other amendment that, again, another really important amendment that a lot of people are familiar with is the Fifth Amendment. Um, the Fifth Amendment gives a person the right of due process of law. So what due process of law really means, it just means that you have the right to a fair process, right? You can't just be thrown in jail without any trial, without knowing what you're charged for. You, if you are arrested and um, charged with a crime, you have the right to go through a process in the judicial system and the government can't just come in and sweep you away. Um, another thing that's really important with this is that it says you cannot be charged twice for the same crime. This is known as double jeopardy. Um, and one of the most famous cases that is involved with this is um, Gideon versus Wainwright, in which a man was charged with robbing a convenience store, and then he was exonerated of the crime. The cops came back and said, hey, we found evidence, and, and so they charged him again twice for the same crime and tried to throw him in jail for that same crime, um, and that was known as double jeopardy. Another really famous case with this is the uh, O.J. Simpson trial. Um, actually, this, this clause in the Fifth Amendment actually protected him uh, because originally, if you didn't know this, uh, Kim Kardashian's dad was O.J. Simpson's lawyer, and he defended him. He said, you know, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. It's a really famous line from the trial. Um, but he was charged with murdering his wife. Um, and in that trial, he was found innocent. Well, later on, they found guilty. The, the, the court said they found more evidence that he's actually guilty. And they tried to go back. And because of this clause, they could not recharge him. Um, so if you didn't know that, that's why the uh, Kardashian family got really rich and famous. Um, and then also the Fifth Amendment protects uh, your right to not testify against yourself. So really what this means, this is your right to remain silent. Everybody knows this from the cop shows, right, where the cops are going through your what are called Miranda rights. The reason they're called Miranda rights is because it was based on a case called Miranda versus Arizona. Um, in that case, is really just solidifying that you have the right to not speak to the cops. Okay, there are only two things you do have to, and you are legally required by law to tell a police officer, and that is your name and your date of birth. Everything else you can remain silent on. Okay, um, and again, I'll talk more about this when we get into our civil liberties unit. And then uh, kind of a random caveat that is added into the Fifth Amendment is uh, this clause that if the government takes your property for private use, then they, um, or for public use, I apologize, then they have to pay you the cost of your private property um, in order to take that from you. So, for example, if they need to build a highway right where your house is, they would have to compensate you. Um, so you can imagine why that would be beneficial especially, uh, you know, you don't want to just lose your house and then, you know, the government comes in and says, hey, you got to give this up for free. Okay, the next two amendments that we're going to talk about, we have to really define two terms. And these two terms are criminal versus civil cases. Okay, so a criminal wrong is punishable by jail time. So in a criminal case, you are either found guilty or innocent. However, there's another type of case, and this is called a civil case. 
So in a civil case, this would be like a lawsuit. And if you lose this, you have to pay money to the other party. Okay, so that's the, the two main differences between criminal law and civil law. So the Sixth Amendment is about your rights in a criminal prosecution. So that in a case where you could be found guilty or innocent. So really what it's doing is it's giving you the right to a speedy trial by jury. A jury is a group of your peers, usually a group of 12 people, and they're the ones that are going to look at the facts that are presented by lawyers and decide if you are uh, innocent or guilty. And then it also states that you have the right to be confronted by a witness. So if someone is accusing you and saying that you did this crime, you have the right to see them in a court of law, to, to know who is accusing you of this crime. Okay, then also this guarantees you the right to legal counsel. So this is where that line from the Miranda right says, you have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. So basically this is ensuring that you have the right to a free public defender in a court of law so you do not have to represent yourself. The Seventh Amendment is dealing with a civil case or a lawsuit. And this says that you have the right to a trial by jury in any lawsuit that is of a value of more than $20. So then you can have a lawyer representing you in this case and a jury will decide if you are what they call liable, meaning you have to pay, or not liable, meaning you don't have to pay. The Eighth Amendment, uh, well, is really important too because it prohibits excessive bail. And bail is, if you don't know, is money you have to pay to get out of jail. And it also prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Um, the reason they included this was prior uh, to their experience with the colonies, people used to be, you know, tortured as a means of punishment. You could uh, be flayed, you could be put out in these little stocks, and you know people could throw food at you. You could have any means of torture done to you, um, and that would be considered legal under law. They wanted to prohibit that, and you know nowadays we have lots of conversations about you know how does who does this apply to, um, specifically in the the debate about the death penalty and capital punishment. You know, some people would argue that the death penalty is actually cruel and unusual punishment, while other people would say that that is retribution or justice. Uh, similarly, in places like um, Guantanamo Bay, where uh, people who are accused of terrorism are housed, they are going through this process without, um, you know, necessarily a trial and uh, some of the conditions they can they consider it to be torture, and so some people argue that that would be considered cruel and unusual punishment, while other people would argue uh, that that was is within the confines of the protections of the Eighth Amendment. So another important one that we debate constantly. The Ninth Amendment says that people have non-enumerated rights. So non-enumerated means essentially not listed. So really, this is like your insurance policy in the Constitution. It says that if a right isn't listed in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights, that doesn't mean you don't have it. They wanted to do this because they were really worried that if they didn't include this, the government would say, well, these are all the rights you have and you, you can't say you have more, right? So they wanted to include this to make sure that just because it's not explicitly stated doesn't mean you don't have it. And then finally, the 10th Amendment is really about this principle of federalism, which you guys took a quiz on earlier this week. And essentially what this does is it says that anything not given to the national or federal United States government in the Constitution is then reserved for the states. So it's really just protecting that each state has the power to make its own decisions about um, different things related to their culture. So, for example, um, cer certain states are more against the issue of abortion, 
right? Uh, so cases like places like Texas and Alabama have stricter laws in those places than other states. Uh, for Colorado, for example, we have marijuana as a legalized uh, substance in this state. Other states have it criminalized. Right. So this is the showing this principle of federalism and how each state can make their own laws to fit their culture. So these are the 10 amendments to the Constitution. And what I would argue um, are some of the most important parts of American government and what I would want you to walk away with knowing at the end of the semester more than anything else, because these are your rights. And it's so important that you understand that. There are 27 amendments in total. Again, later on, we'll talk about the other amendments, but these first 10 were created when this country was initially um, created. So let me know if you have any questions about this assignment. Uh, you will be going through and doing a matching assignment as well as applying these amendments to different headlines that we have today. I hope this video was informative and I will see you guys in class.